Okay. Can everyone hear me? Anyone see me? Um, appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So, can anyone uh, give me feedback on this? Because I need to know if I'm being seen and being heard. And if the quality's coming in okay, which it seems to be. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, hi there, everybody. I'm Nick Ford. I represent the uh, Alliance of the Libertarian Left of New England. Um, we are at ne.libertarianleft.org. I'm here today to talk about two topics that I think are of a special relevant interest to libertarians everywhere, um, that being the ideas of polyamory and left libertarianism. Um, my, my talk, just a nitpick, is actually called Polyamory and Left Libertarianism, not the other way around, but doesn't really matter. Um, so, um, I just want to begin by introducing myself. I am a left-wing market anarchist, although I, I more identify as an anarchist without adjectives in a uh, Volturing Declares tradition. Um, and I am a left libertarian more generally. Um, uh, I blog at uh, theanarchisttownship.com uh, and I'll put that in the chat room. Um, and I do writing writings for um, for Gonzo Times. Um, I don't know. Uh, not too much to say about me. Uh, the Alliance of Libertarian Left is a coalition of mutualists, voluntarists, um, libertarian socialists, um, and uh, dialectical libertarians, green libertarians, radical minarchists, and others on the libertarian left. You can go to all-left.net, I believe it is, and, um, and check it out. Um, so my blog is this, so I can sh shamelessly self-promote myself. Um, and uh, I hope everyone sees that. I've been having problems with um, being seen and being uh, being seen on the chat room. Um, and then all-left.net is where you can find I um, is where you can find more info on the um, Alliance Libertarian Left. So I apologize for my all of my ums and all that. So let's get right into it. Um, of course, I just did it again. So I'm here to talk about polyamory and left libertarianism. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, my talk and then talk about what is polyamory, talk about what is left libertarianism, and then talk about how they might be able to interact in um, some sort of fashion. Um, so I'm going to introduce both topics. Um, I do not purport to be an expert on either topics, especially not polyamory. Um, for full disclosure, I am not in myself a polyamorous relationship. I am very much interested in the idea of it. Um, and I am, um, I've been in talks about it at the Alt Expo, which you can look up on YouTube. Um, I've read many articles, I've read a book about it, I've talked to many people about it, so I do have experience, um, with it in a limited fashion, but I do not purport, purport to be any sort of guru or expert on it. Um, so I'm going to be introducing the basics about polyamory, more so than left libertarianism, but we'll get into that. So I want to start, um... The last time I did this talk out, it was 40 minutes, so I should have about 15 minutes or so of qu questions and answers. Uh, left libertarianism and polyamory are both pretty controversial topics, um, even within libertarians and anarchist circles. So I do expect some questions, but um, I do have one question already um, that I have in mind to answer, or give my best effort to answer. Um, so let's get started. Uh, it's about 5.05, .05, so I figure I might as well get started now that that introduction is out of the way. So, um, polyamory and left libertarianism, an introduction. Words are always a tricky thing. We always want to communicate the best we can with the tools that we have, but sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes, even though you've clarified yourself countless times, some people are still scratching their heads. And I think this is why it's a good start um, to define the terms in the title of this essay instead of just going right into it. Even though these terms may be familiar to some, it's doubtful that they're in the majority that are listening to this talk. And within that slim major minority that actually might know what I'm talking about or have some preconceptions or pre-notions, uh, they may have a distorted view of it or may just need a refresher. Um, so... Similar, uh, similarly, combining or trying to get se seemingly unrelated ideas together, and in this case it's polyamory and left libertarianism, uh, is another problem that runs deep within humans. How do we merge ideas? Are ideas ever worth merging, especially if they're not necessarily seen as complementary? 
how exactly do you go about explaining merged terms once they're you know merged with each other? Um, yet with all these questions in my mind, in my mind, my task after the two-part introduction is to try to see how these terms interact. And finally, I want to give a brief sketch, very brief sketch, of what I see as a far more loving and free world. This world, in my opinion, would be much more accepting and tolerant of the differences that make us all individuals and allow human autonomy to flourish more easily. So that's basically what's go what I'm going to be doing during the essay. Um, and of course, questions are welcome. You can ask them during my talk, but don't expect me to answer them until after the talk. Um, so I hope my feed is still coming in okay. If my feed at some point stops uh, coming in okay, let me know. Um, but so far, I'm looking at the chat room area, and it seems to be going fine. Um, so with that all in mind, let's get started. Um, so what is polyamory? I want to begin with this and put more of a heavy-duty heavy, uh, heavy duty, uh, emphasis on it because um, I believe it's a lot more unknown in the libertarian movement as a, as a whole than, um, uh, than left libertarianism is. So to break down this world word in half, not world, poly is a Greek word which means many or several, while amory is Latin for love. Think amor or some other variant. So polyamory literally means, or linguistically means, or whatever, means many love, or plurally, many loves. But for me, this is not a sufficient definition for explaining what polyamory is in practice, or how it might interact with any political philosophy, let alone the highly misunderstood one of left libertarianism. And so beyond meaning many loves, polyamory means for me, a long-term committed and consensual relationship between more than two partners. There are multiple definitions of polyamory, of course, and mine may not be the only legitimate one. Uh, therefore, I do recommend checking out several different sources and sorting out for yourself what polyamory means to you. So, um, for example, you could check out, you could just Google search polyamory. You'll get tons of results. Uh, a few of them might be, you might come across the polyamory.org site, which is a fairly extensive FAQ on polyamory. Or you could go into the polyamory.com forums and learn from other people there. There are also plenty of articles, YouTube videos, and even blog sites completely dedicated to polyamory. And yes, yes, my internet friends, there are actually real-life people who you can talk to about it that you might meet at first through the internet. Oh my god. An example of one piece in particular um, I found pretty good, but others might not, uh, which is why I recommend going as deep as you um, want to into learning about polyamory is Steve Pavlina's blog post on January 2nd, 2009, which is simply titled Polyamory. It's a pretty long post, but it also gets across a lot of the points and counterpoints you'll see in discussions of polyamory. However, my point here is that there are many options for those who are curious about what polyamory is about, and you don't just have to rely on this talk or the Alt Expo talk that happened uh, during Porkfest. And uh, for those who are going to look more into it, I encourage you to not stop with only what I've suggested, because really it's just the tip of the iceberg, probably, but go as deep as you feel comfortable with. So, um, polyamory is confused with oft often confused with things like swing or basic sluttery, but the way I've defined it here precludes both of those types of sexual preferences. But this is not to say that there is anything wrong with being a swinger or having the disposition that just having sex with anyone is fine. In fact, uh, taking cues from the book that I'll talk about a little bit later um, called The Ethical Slut, I think being a slut can be a wonderful thing for those who can do it right. Some people may say, but wait, isn't being a slut being a liar and being immoral, being the mistress of a lonely husband and so on? But this isn't necessarily the case, because just being a slut just means you're really sexually uh, adventurous, love to flirt, and have sex with as many people as you can. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with something like this, so long as the in inter uh, interrelations or interactions remain consensual and mutually beneficial for all parties involved. Nothing at all wrong with that. Uh, now, maybe the slut, the slut is doing it for the experience of being a slut, or maybe for the pure enjoyment of it, or something else, but either way, I don't think it's anyone's business what the reasoning for it is, unless uh, it is somewhat non-consensual, dishonest, i.e. fraudulent, or somehow reinforces inequality in, real, in relations. Um, that's a bit of my left libertarianism speaking there. Uh, furthermore, insofar as the slut does things consensually, honestly, and does it for the mutual benefit of all involved, it's no, one business, it's no one's business what happens, uh, like I just said. So I could go into a, um, a talk about sluts in the term and, and how um, girls get the raw end of the stick when it comes to um, 
uh, battering terminology like that or using it in a battering sort of way. But I won't get into it here. If you want me to ask questions about how I feel about the, the double standards in society, then, you know, feel free. Um, now, there are other people who talk about the rise of sluttery as the decay of traditional society. And, and they are in some ways right and wrong about their criticism of free love. Though, as an aside, though an important one, I may add, perhaps the term free love is redundant. Consider what Emma Goldman, an anarchist in the 20th century, I had to say about it in her essay, Marriage and Love. Quote, Free love, as if love is anything but free. Man has bought brains, but all the millions in the world have failed to buy love. Man has subdued bodies, but all the power on earth has been able to, unable to subdue love. Man has conquered whole nations, but all his armies could not conquer love. Man has chained and fettered the spirit, but he has been utterly helpless before love. High on a throne, with all the splendor and uh, pomp his gold can command, man is yet poor and desolate if love passes him by. And if it stays, the poorest hovel is radiant with warmth, with life and color. Thus love has the magic power to make of a beggar a king. Yes, love is free. It can dwell in no other atmosphere. Uh, Marriage and Love, by the way, is a terrific essay, um, which I really recommend to all anarchists and people in general, of course. So, um, I think the saying goes to the ideas of polyamory, and why I'm quoting it is that such relations of polyamory can only exist in an atmosphere of freeness, or if you prefer, liberty. When I talk of sluthood being a good thing, I mean being an ethical slut, that is, being a person who is aware of the context of their actions and does not try to perpetuate dishonesty or, harmful or other harmful things into relationships through purposeful intent. These things, voluntary cooperation, honesty, commitment, consent, and more that go into a truly wonderful and functional polyamorous relationship help promote the atmosphere of freeness Goldman talks about, and even more in general it promotes that. Um, that's just one reason why I think things like left libertarianism is especially compatible with polyamorous relations. It is because they both complement each other's environment and atmosphere of freedom, but I'll talk about that more in later, uh, more in depth later. So, um, that said, traditional society is something that I think has outlived its purpose for the most part. There is no sense in maintaining societies that rely on the use of force, physiological and psychological torture, that repress the human sexual drive. And any society that is governed by forces that would ordain such methods of keeping a stable society deserve neither the power to do so nor the stable society to begin with. Um, if society is to be stable, let it be raised from the bottom up organically with lots and lots of love, uh, just making sure that my feed is still okay. Um, I'm going to reload the chat room just to see if I'm missing any comments or anything. So if you hear me for a second or any advertisements, I apologize. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a second to make sure I'm up to date. So I'm just going to pause for a second. Oh. Sorry about that. Okay, so apparently my, my feed is still coming in good cause, or well because um, my... Um, someone just texted me what I just said, so apparently my thoughts are, are, okay, no new comments, thank you, Scott, I appreciate that, um, I'm getting, I get kind of paranoid about that kind of stuff, um, thank you, Scott, so anyway, um, I apologize if the, um, if my feed comes back on and double, um, <coughs> I just wanted to make sure that, uh, everything was okay, uh, I just wanted to make oh. sure that, uh, everything was okay, uh, I just there we go. Sorry about that. See? I told you that happened. So, um, anyway. So we're talking about lots and lots of love. Yeah. A whole lot of love. But more to the point, yes, traditional society would in many ways fall if polyamory was more widely accepted. But I ask, why is that a bad thing? Um, the accuser uh, presupposes that traditional society is necessarily a good thing. But why? Uh, uh, have they looked... Have they looked at the amount of wars in the world lately? Sorry, if people are texting me. Have they looked at the shape of the world and how there's still a lot of division between the ones who rule and the ones who are, that are ruled? The way people are oppressed in almost every way possible of expressing themselves, not the least of which is sexually. Um, to further that point, is sex not taught to be evil, or sometimes a necessary evil, just for procreation, and, that's too mu and that too much sex breeds sin? Now, if this be tradition, I say be gone with it. It was dead when it set its foot in the door in my eyes. And that's how I feel about that. 
But in another sense, they're wrong, because the accuser here most likely thinks that traditional society is the only society possible. And so when they say that freeing more things would lead to a less traditional society, what they're really trying to say is that society itself is what's at stake. It's, it's kind of like Orwellian doublespeak. Uh, really, uh, really what they're trying to do is distort words and meanings. Again, doublespeak. However, the free association of man and woman, woman and woman, man and man, etc., etc., um, has never, to my knowledge, led to some sort of widespread chaos that can never have been solved, even if it, even, even if it happened. Now, I'm kind of uh, nervous about this part because I think people might misconstrue why I'm bringing up these uh, historical uh, events, but I assure you, or at least I hope, that nobody will. Um, so I'm going to bring them up. Uh, a few examples to substantiate myself are in order, of course, I believe. So, for example, in Greece, homoerotic relationships were actually quite common. Now, you can actually look that up on Wikipedia, and, um, and, and, uh, and see that, um, sorry, don't stamp text. Um, a few examples, uh, so the relations between a boy who wanted to learn more and a man who was willing to teach would in fact be sometimes be transacted through voluntary sexual relations between the two. Of course, the Greeks are well known for many of their contributions to modern society. Um, uh, if anyone remembers the life of Brian, you know, I think, I think that was against the Greeks. I actually was against the Romans. Never mind. So anyway, making it the way it is, so you can see for yourself how badly sexual freedoms can make society. I do want to make it clear, however, that I'm not here for to advocate extraneous things like old men dating young boys or whatever. And instead, the example is more used for the same sex relationship factor and the fact that um, Greek society um, has brought a lot to modern day society. Um, and the result of those homoerotic relations did not uh, tend for society to dissolve. Um, it was more about slavery, empire, um, so on and so forth. So um, I do not also think time or space here would permit to address the age factor, but there are a lot of gray areas, and it's just too much time in this essay. But suffice to say, I believe the state handles the whole ordeal poorly. Of course, as an anarchist, I think you know the state handles basically everything poorly. Um, and in current day society, relations between same sexes have become more and more common in a polyamorous way. For example, the Mormon religion, one of the most popular in the world, though that doesn't make it a good one, was built on the idea that a man having many women was not inherently a bad thing and was originally one of the main tenets of being a Mormon. Now, how the Mormons handled the women is another thing that I'm unsure of, and from what I've heard, I do not necessarily endorse how they um, react. Um, so, anyway, from what I understand, they reduce the women's tra traditional roles, you know, get back in the kitchen, make me a sandwich, and have a lot more say in the marriages than the women do, which is certainly not what I support, and usually the men are much older than the women, taking advantage of them, etc. Still, these examples are not meant to be cited for the perfection, but only to illustrate that the conservatives' feelings on this matter are misguided, and history has shown this in different ways. I'm sure there are other things I could cite, but I believe my point has been made. Now, the flaws and detractors aside, let's continue. Is it possible to be polyamorous? Of course, you know, it's nice to talk about polyamory, but can po people actually be polyamorous? I'd say so. For example, look at the July 2009 article, Only You and You and You. In it, the author, 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 author Jessica Bennett had a great passage about the movement of polyamory, an idea in which I think is worth quoting at length. Quote, Researchers are just beginning to study the phenomenon, but the few do estimate that openly polyamorous families, and this is just families in the United States, number more than half a million, with thriving contingents in nearly every major city. Over the past year, books like Open by journalist Jenny Block, Opening Up by sex columnist Tristan Taramino, and an updated of The Ethical Slut, widely considered the modern poly Bible, and it's a great book, have helped publicize the concept. Today, there are poly blogs, and poly blogs, uh, not poly wogs, that's a Pokemon. And podcasts, local get-togethers, and an online polyamory magazine called Loving More with 15,000 regular readers. Celebrities like actress Tilda Swinton and Carla Bruni, the first lady of France, have both voiced support for non-monogamy, while Greenan herself has become somewhat of an unofficial spokesman as the creator of a comic web uh, series with a practice called Family that's loosely based on her life. There have always been some loudmouth ironclads talking about the labor of monog monogamy, and uh, talking about and multiple partner relationships, says Ken, Ken Haslam, a retired anesthesiologist who curates a polyamory library at the Indi Indiana University-based Kinsley Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction. 
uh, and to finish the quote, but finally, with the Internet, the thing has really come about. Emphasis added, um, and I'll talk more about that article in my notes. I, did think, I do think then it becomes obvious that polyamory, at least as an idea, has only been growing in success in the 500,000 people just in the U.S. alone. Now, keep in mind, that's just the U.S. I mean, there are a lot more liberal policies in Europe um, about sex and stuff like that um, that go on, and that could definitely, um, definitely contribute to even more polyamorous, rela polyamorous relationships. Uh, oh, 38 people. Let's see if we can get to 50. Anyway... Um, wouldn't that be awesome? So, um, it's really uh, only gotten more pervasive as time goes on. I mean, you might say this is from 2009, and it could have gone way down by then, or even a little bit down, but I think it's worth noting that part about the Internet. It's, the Internet has only gotten bigger and bigger as time goes on, and polyamory only seems to get more and more talked about, even within libertarian circles. Uh, I mean, there was a huge crowd, um, and as Scott Patrick points out, uh, anarchism, polyamory, and free love in general have a long history together. So this isn't this isn't a new thing. This isn't you know it's just kind of new to some people here because they're not familiar with the ideas that they could be compatible. So anyway, sorry about that again. In fact, as the article points out, many people currently in the world are polyamorous, though you may not know it. And this is probably one of the most unfortunate things. This is because the poly commun community at large has a double-edged tendency to hide itself in the public eye at times. Now, why? Well, anarchists and libertarians alike are going to like slash dislike this. This is because they are a persecuted minority that the law does not look favorably on. What a surprise. Consider another one of Bennett's passages in her 2009 article that I, that I just quoted from. Polys themselves are not visible. Quote: Polys themselves are not visibly crusading for their civil rights, but there is one policy issue rousing concern: legal precedent uh, concern, legal precedents concerning their ability to parent. Custody battles among poly parents are not uncommon. The most pub public of them was a 1990 ca 1999 case in which a 22-year-old Tennessee woman lost rights to parent her daughter after outing herself on MTV documentary. Now you can see more about. Um, uh, you can see more about um, these. Um, <laughs> you can see more about these uh, ideas about um, polyamorous people uh, hiding from the law and stuff on the Alt Expo talk about polyamory, which I'll link after my talk is done. Uh, it's a very good 45-minute talk. It's not that long at all. Because of things like this, some poly groups or people who identify as polyamorous on a personal level do not identify openly as such for fear of the state. But even worse than this is that some may even get sucked into traditional, traditional relations because there is no real state protection or aid for them, like there is for the usual monogamous relationships. This leads to an arbitrary and artificial rise of monogamy just because people feel like they have no other choice other than to be monogamous. Thus, I see society as a very much monogamous by default, um, monogamous by default uh, culture in which all relationships in the media are monogamous ones. Excuse me. Or where there are other people, it's always the dirty slut or the conniving husband or some other contrived stereotype. But in reality, many polyamorous relationships can and most likely have been happy and full of love. Lots and lots of love. Um, it's not within the scope of this essay to do a complete detailing of the workings of polyamorous relationships, living arrangements, how kids could uh, fare under it. I will get to that stuff later, though. Or how the work... Um, in the Q&A, or how they'll work in different scenarios and different people. But if you so wish, you can make the wise investment of your time, money, and resources to buy the book The Ethical Slut, and the, the updated second edition is what I, of course, recommend, uh, by Dossie Easton and Janet W. Hardy. As you, as you read, you'll find so much advice on polyamory, what it's about, what it looks like, can look like, might look like in the future, and relationship advice that you won't know what to do with at first, and a lot more. I cannot highly recommend this book enough for one's understanding of not only polyamory, but for relationships in general. This book is fantastic for monogamous couples as well. A brief little anecdote. Uh, me and my girlfriend, or my partner, uh, I use the terms interchangeably, but I tr I'm trying to use partner more. Um, and you can ask me about that in the Q&A if you wish. But um, we read the book together, actually. Um, we... Uh, I, I read the book first by myself, or at least most of it by myself, and then we read the book together, and it was very, um, it was very romantic, actually. It was very nice, I, I guess I'd say. Maybe not romantic is the right word. Reading's romantic, man. 
Um, but either way, uh, it was a very fun experience, and I really recommend it to all couples, not just polyamorous couples or couples that are interested in becoming polyamorous. So, um, so anyway, um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, so now I'd like to say that at no point in this essay, no point, will I try to assert, as some may, that polyamory is more natural or inherently better than monogamy or something like that. I will also not suggest that everyone should be polyamorous or that polyamory is perfect or has never failed. This is not true. This is not what I will do. This is because I do not want it in a box. I do not want it with a fox. This is because polyamory is like any other human relation and perhaps more complicated in some aspects as one might imagine. And it is prone to failure, just like monogamy is. Maybe even less so, but I'm speculating. I want as many people as possible to understand now if they do not agree with anything I've said thus far, to at least keep in mind that most polyamorous tending people would allow you to continue your own monogamous relations regardless of whether you like their lifestyle. That's something important to keep in mind. Now the question is, would you do the same for those who want to be polyamorous? And yes, Kevin, that was, uh, that was Dr. Seuss. That was... Um, you know, green eggs and ham. I was just making a little pun or joke there. Um, so notes, uh, the first quote is taken from Emma, Emma Goldman's Marriage and Love, which can be found online. Um, just look it up. For general information on the phenomenon of uh, men and children in Greece, or maybe not children, but young boys, um, young men, I recommend the Wikipedia on it uh, about homosexuality, homosexuality in ancient Greece. It's pretty informative. It's got some links and discussions. Uh, the article that I linked by uh, Bennett can be found at the Daily Beast, uh, but you can just look it up, you know. Um. So um, that's that's my, uh, my my girlfriend who keeps texting me because she apparently can't just comment on the uh, on the chat room. So I'm gonna call her out here and and uh, and so so there. So anyway, you can find uh, um, the. Um, Sorry, I was just checking the time. You can uh, find ethical the ethical slut uh, for a pretty reasonable price at Amazon. I think it's under thirty bucks. It's definitely under thirty bucks. It's probably under fifteen. Uh, but you should probably check out sites like half dot com or whatever it is, and just look for lower prices. Don't automatically go to uh, Amazon. Plus, Amazon does, has done shitty things like um, break ties with WikiLeaks and break ties with Anonymous or or whatever. It's just done some crappy things. So anyway. I want to go into uh, what is left libertarianism. Now, this I don't purport to be an expert on either, but I purport to be a lot more knowledgeable on left libertarianism, which is not to say I'm not knowledgeable about polyamory. I think I just demonstrated at least to some extent that I am. But to a larger extent, I focused a lot more about on left libertarianism. Um, so uh, what is left libertarianism? Well, bring back the personal, the personal back to the political, as I think we should, we look we uh we begin to look at a fringe group within an already existing fringe group as some have so affectionately called it um so i talk of course about the red spades and the black hearts credit to roderick t long for that uh idea um of the left libertarians now perhaps you don't want to hear more terms more definitions more schisms more literature more libertarian nonsense if you don't like libertarianism at all um, more defending of the rich, more beating on the poor, or something else entirely. But I assure you that left libertarianism not only has a great tradition, but the real tradition that libertarians have been missing ever since Ayn Rand, Mises, and company started trying to bring capitalism back into style. Um, there is certainly a confusion of terms in the world and in the libertarian movement, and this is no different here. Definitions of capitalism and socialism, left and right, state and government, etc., etc., have raged for quite a long time with factions breaking off with their own definitions, term usages, and favorite historical figures, and what I like to call their favorite scriptures and texts, um, and so forth, and then forming their own small groups. But this one group of left libertarians, or people who call themselves such, I want to discuss, um, have in my opinion managed to do this and actually build on this perhaps viable tradition and history that so many libertarians have forgotten. Now there are different types of left libertarians. If you go to the Wikipedia article on it, um, there should be a, a, a section that says like freed markets or contemporary freed markets or something. That's basically what I'm talking about. Think Brad Spangler, Charles Johnson, um, uh, you know, people like that, um, Gary Chartier, um, Sheldon Richman, uh, many others. I mean, you know, that's just to name a few. Um, so why left? Why do we call ourselves left libertarians? Well, what's the purpose of having left libertarian, uh, left, left and left libertarian have for us? 
After all, it's some like Walter Block, or more recently, more recently when I wrote this, Anthony Gregory has stated in Why the Left Fears Libertarianism, though I don't think they should. We are neither on the left or the right, but I fear that both Block and Gregory miss the point of these labels sometimes, and so do other libertarians. The labels, like all labels, are not meant to be precise. Words have never been an exact science, well, maybe except for that sentence. Um, words have never been an exact science, well, maybe except for that sentence like I just said, but nonetheless it seems foolhardy for us as libertarians to just reject not only the current political spectrum, but then claim we are neither left nor right, but somehow above the whole ordeal. This strikes me poorly for a few reasons. Not only does it scream of intellectual elitism as if we're somehow better than the other people who call themselves on the right or left, or left or right, as I originally wrote it, but it makes marketing and having alliances with others a little bit harder. Not only this, but historically, the political spectrum did at one time actually reflect where libertarians would be on the spectrum, and it seems silly to me to not bring this up, if not just as a legitimate fact of history. Back during the times of the French Assembly, people who sat on the right favored monopolies, a big government, a traditional lifestyle, perhaps, and many other restrictions on individual liberties. The people further to the left, however, people like Pierre-Joseph Proulx, my... French accent sucks, and Frederick Bastiat, were in favor of more libertarian property. Gradually, less and less government in people's lives, they were against the monarchies, the aristocracies, and the landholding class that had gotten it through conquest. The people were uh, on the left were called liberals, and rightly so. They wanted to liberate the people and had set up beliefs and ideas of how to do so. They were the revolutionaries of their time. They did not buy the wars of the bureaucracy, and they had a much wide, wide range of wide ranger, wider range of concerns than just private property violations and aggression against the lower ruled class. But th these, of course, were concerns. And so the libertarian rightly understood was the first liberal, or the first leftist, if you will. There's an excellent article on Mises.org, of all places, called The First Leftist, that talks about the same thing, and I recommend it for more info on this particular subject, of course. In this article, Dean Russell discusses how the first leftist could be compared to the one on the right, which is another passage I think is worth quoting at length, for showing how the differences were, were between the right and the left at the time more clearly. He, he says, quote, The leftists wanted wages, prices, and profits to be determined by competition in a free market and not by government decree. They were pledged to free their economy from government planning and to remove the government guaranteed special privileges of guilds, unions, and associations, um, uh, and associations whose members were banded together to, to use the law to set the price of their labor or capital or product above what it would be in a free market. While the right, quote, stood for a highly centralized national government, special laws and privileges for unions and various other groups and classes, government economic monopolies and various necessities of life, and a continuation of government controls over prices, production, and distribution. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as Scott is saying... Um, there's certainly a wide range of people that could be considered left libertarian. Some are libertarian socialists, and no, that's not a contradiction. Uh, depends on your definitions. Uh, I'm not getting into capitalism versus socialism. That is one part of this I am not touching. I don't care about the debate, and I'm an anarchist without adjectives first. I do not care about um, capitalism and socialism. Um, so, that's my thought on that. If you really want to know where I stand, Ask me at some other point, I guess, because I don't really want to talk about it here. It's just an annoying subject. Um, so the leftist was not the first social democrat, is not the Trotskyite, or the Stalinist, or the Marxist. In fact, these are all authoritarians in leftist clothing. In point of fact, these sorts of leftists do not support any sort of revolution or support of individual liberties like the people in the French Assembly, people like Bastiat and Proudhon did. So, anyway, if one were to read this article, they would notice that there's unfortunately a good deal of worship of the Founding Fathers and government in a sort of oxymoronic, or limited government in some sort of oxymoronic, limited form. Oh, repeating myself, sorry. Uh, it is certainly not within the scope of this essay to debate whether limited government is a possibility or a desired p possibility. Um, and uh, But I do bring it up only to say that it's not, that it's, that it's that part of it is not important to the article. What is important is the fact that the first leftists can be more rightly seen as libertarians and not the authoritarians many libertarians see the current left as. Uh, in the previous talk, Angela Keaton was kind of bashing modern leftists. Um, make no mistake, modern leftists in many ways are very troubled and very confused, but their intents are usually in the, good, in the right place, 
and I do think there are hope uh, hopes for um, building coalitions along um, not not only anarcho party lines but uh, across the political spectrum, especially with leftists more more so than than with conservatives. So it is in this tradition, and then radicalizing it to the form of anarchism, that the left libertarian takes some of their tradition from. But some people say this is an archaic history lesson that is nothing to that is nothing to offer modern libertarians. But I reply, if you want to discard with the entire current political spectrum and all of its history, shouldn't you consult history to see if there, it was ever on your side? I mean, shouldn't you? Is it not helpful to be historically accurate? Even if this fact is abstract and seldom known right now, does that make it any less right or true? Does that make it any less usable for our cause? I do not think it's the, that, that it's the case that we cannot use history just because some of it may go unnoticed in the telling of tyrants. And as we all know, tyrants are pe the people who usually write history because they are usually the victors. Now, this is one thing anarchists have to work to change. So why, this is why we use left and left libertarianism. It is to be historically accurate with the tradition of what being a leftist really meant, supporting individual liberties against oppression in multiple different ways, especially against government oppression, but not only that. For instance, a left libertarian may make the tradition of things like feminism, anti-racism, and other possible, possible cult cultural equalizers in order to have a much more balanced society, uh, not doing it through force or coercion. They may argue that while abolishing the government is important, and it sure as hell is, it doesn't make sense to just stop there certainly doesn't. It may be further argued that there are other, many other types of oppression out there that need to be dealt with even once government is gone. In this way, left libertarians are inherently thick, or in other words, they have a concerns, or a huge, or a big bundle of concerns, uh, just, besides just the typical concern for private property, and thus the non-aggression principle, etc. Thick libertarianism for me is something that's very important, uh, important, important. Wow, I'm not even from New York. Um, no offense to people who are. Anyway, um, so another writing I recommend on the subject is Professor Gary Chartier's. He spoke earlier about how there's war and then there's everything else um, about the left and left libertarianism. That's his. Um, that's the post that I'm talking about here. It gives a whole host of reasons why the libertarian call themselves left libertarians. Now, for instance, Gary. For, uh, I'm going to first quote Gary um, by saying. He says, an authentically leftist position, I suggest, is marked by opposition to subordination, exclusion, and deprivation. He then describes each of these things. Um, so, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote four, three passages. And the first one's going to be about subordination, the second about exclusion, and the third about deprivation. This is all by um, uh, Gary Chartier, um, the left and left libertarianism. You can Google search it, um, but I recommend saying... The left and left libertarianism, Chartier, that's C-H-A-R-T-I-E-R, -E and then you'll find it actually on someone else's blog, and it'll link to the original posting. But you can just read it there, too. So, about subordination. Um, one person, A, is subordinate to another, B, when B has significant persistent power over A. The power involved may be physical, but it also may be economic, psychic, social, or cultural. If you don't like psychic, uh, I'm saying this, by the way. If you don't like psychic, you can just say... Uh, psychological or, or mental. Um, uh, the important thing is that B determines to some meaningful degree what A does. A is significantly unfree in relation to B, either because B can impose on A some cost that A is unwilling to bear, or because A genuinely, but mistakenly, believes that B is entitled to determine the character of A's conduct. I'm willing to clarify this, extrapolate on, go more in depth. Um, etc., etc., for all these things, but I'm not going to go in too much depth here. Depth. Anyway. So, uh, so for exclusion, some person A is excluded from a group when it is made clear that she does not belong to the group, that she is entitled neither to the material incidents of membership nor to the recognition as a fellow member and respect associated with belonging. End quote. Now, Gary notes that some relationships are necessarily exclusionist, such as of all things that he notes, monogamous relationships, intimate friendships, etc. But the position of the leftist is not to reduce. Um, um, but the position of the leftist is not uh, to reduce the ones that happen naturally, but only artificially and arbitrarily. So I want to pause for a second and say that my my girlfriend has been texting me this whole time, and um, and now she's basically asking. Um, Yes, uh, Derek makes a good point. Uh, anarchism is skeptical of property too. This is this is true. Um, so um, my uh, she was asking how you get involved with the chat room. Well, basically, um, if you're on this channel, um, you just go to discuss this event. If you're logged into Facebook, you can do it. Um, 
if you're not logged into Facebook, I don't know what you can do, but um, you should be logged on in onto Facebook um, to talk um, in the chat room. So, um, so anyway, thank you, Derek. I appreciate that. Um, so anyway, I'm going to try to stay on uh, topic as much as possible. So anyway, um, some person, A, uh, again, this, this is about deprivation. This is the last quote. Experiences deprivation if she lacks the resources needed for, uh, uh, one, physical survival and health, two, clothing and shelter, and three, material circumstances that qualify as minimally dignified in accordance with the norms prevailing in her community. Now, again, I cannot honestly say it's within the scope of this essay to give the readers a complete overhaul of what I speak of here and what Gary is saying as well, but I hope it has gotten their attention and to have them look for more. I have spent more con much more considerable time on describing and defending polyamory because, as I've said twice already, I believe, it's my belief that polyamory is far less understood or at the very least less known in the libertarian movement. I think of it that at least left libertarians are at least vaguely known, if usually misidentified and misinterpreted to many libertarians and that this is a very and and so I only give a very brief outlook of what being a left libertarian uh, will be give uh, and I'm hoping that'll give them left le reasons to discredit them but who knows maybe you found more reasons to um, maybe you found more reasons to hate us left libertarians and maybe we're just juveniles and scourges of the sea and just a bunch of miscreants but you know whatever uh, I wish, uh, I thought, uh, Stefan Cantillo would be here, um, and that would have been kind of funny because, um, he has a notorious relation with, uh, the left libertarians. Not to call him, well, I guess I did call him out, I apologize, I didn't mean to, but I just thought it would have been funny. Um, anyway, moving on. I am certainly willing to elaborate on any points, any points, I've made on polyamory or left libertarianism, um, during the questions and answers section of this talk. Within the scope of looking for more, um, I must recommend all-left.net, which I have already posted, but I'll post again. Um, it has a just a fantastic, fantastic um, uh, array of uh, essays and blog posts and everything else that you might want. Um, it's the official page of the Alliance of Libertarian Left. Um, I actually represent the... Um, the uh, Alliance of the Libertarian Left of New England... Uh, and you can find us at any.libertarianleft.org. Um, you can also find us on um, on Facebook. So um, I recommend checking out our page where we basically... I mean, I'm the only one posting, but I basically update it every day, if not. And the blog, which basically is what any.libertarianleft.org is, um, is updated every week on a Monday, usually, but not all the time. So, uh, I must recommend these uh, essays that are located on all-left.net if you're having trouble determining um, which ones you want to pick. Libertarian Left, Free Market Anti-Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, for an introduction, which is by Sheldon Richmond. Um, fantastic article. I loved it the moment I started reading it. Um, that's for an introduction. Libertarianism Through Thick and Thin by the always excellent Charles Johnson um, for an application of additional principles. I'd also highly recommend, and I don't know why it's not listed here, but Kevin Carson's Iron Fist Behind the Invisible Hand. Wow. If you are looking for a tremendous read about the histor the one a wonderfully accurate account of the rise of actually existing capitalism and many left and the opinion of many left libertarians on it, this is the this is the pamphlet for you. This is the reading for you. It's Kevin Carson is by far one of my favorite you'll hear this often within left libertarians, by the way. At least the sort I'm talking about. Um Kevin Carson's awesome. I, I, I'm just going to say, I mean, I, I should just, that should be my presentation. Kevin Carson is awesome. Um, but anyway. Um, so with the two terms defined and some misconceptions and clarifications out of the way, it is now t time to see how they interact with each other. Uh, I apologize, but it's like already 543. I'm going to try to do this as fast as I can while still taking your questions. Um, you can find me, of course, on Facebook. So if you have any questions, just feel free to drop by and ask me. Um, so um, anyway. So I'm going to skip the notes because they're not that important. I've already explained them. So how do polyamory and left libertarianism interact? Well, now is the time to ask the questions that I asked at the beginning of this essay. How do things interact? Why should they interact at all? Is it useful to combine concepts? Uh, for one thing, things naturally interact with each other in this world whether we like it or not. Ideas and concepts are always inexorably tied to, one, uh, to ones whether we recognize it not or not whether we recognize it or not at first. I apologize. Sometimes I try to talk too fast and um, I mash up my words. 
And so clearly, if it can happen naturally, it may also happen artificially. For instance, if we can instill some outside meaning into the relationship you're trying to establish. This is not to say that doing so will make it false. Just like adding other concerns to libertarianism, such as cultural concerns, and left libertarians aren't the only libertarians that can be culturally aware. Right libertarians can be so, as such as well, but they're typically not as thick. Um, typically. Um, uh, so, such as cultural concerns, does not mean libertarians become libertarianism itself becomes fake or something. It just means that it is a supplement with other theories on how to get how best to get to a more individually free society. Likewise, here libertar left libertarianism and polyamory supplement each other as social excuse me social ideas of how people do, how people do and should act. But is combining concepts useful? I feel this is a heavily contextual question, one that cannot be answered universally, but only within the confines of the concept and ideas being discussed here. Within the context here, I feel that it's useful um, to relate ideas of love to left libertarianism to show that libertarianism is not shy to say what personal relationships ought to look more like in a free society. Now, this is not, and I repeat, not to say that force should be used to ensure that things go like this exactly, or that everyone should be acting the same way like we're in some sort of borg. It's useful here because polyamory is an idea and a practice to have people create a better life for themselves, and it is largely done without the state getting involved, and is usually done in spite of it. In fact, the poly community itself would most likely be an excellent cultural and social alternative to reach out to as libertarians. Again, marketing has its place as long as it reflects a genuine interest in other people and their own concerns, and it is not just a matter of pros proselytizing other people for the movement that you love so much. So yes, I feel as if the two concepts are not only individually useful, but uh, together could be even more beneficial for both movements. Now, why should they interact, though? Why should an idea like polyamory go along with the many ideas of left libertarianism? Well, for one, I think the idea of sexual liberation and freedom is something that libertarians have long forgotten, for the most part. There are notable exceptions, like Sharon Presley and other anarcho-feminists. Uh, Adult sexually repressed culture is not a healthy culture, a culture, and one that may be prone to become heavily distorted if it's not distorted to begin with, uh, so as to cause that. And this is due to the imbalance of feelings in our bodies that naturally occur from repressing who we really are. If we cannot express our loves freely so long as it harms no one else, what sort of freedom do we really have? This extends to sex, too. If we not, cannot be ourselves sexually, then who can we be? What will society make us? Are we just creating ourselves in our own meaning through the distorted lens that the society has wrought due to perverse incentives from higher up? All these are questions I think that are important and ones I do not feel the current libertarian movement does a very good job of addressing in any substantial fashion. Back in the 60s and 70s, however, the sexual liberation movement was in swing, the second wave of feminism was reaching America, the anti-war counterculture and the anti-state movement was trying to find its place, all these things had to, at some point or another, look for alternatives outside the state or do things in spite of the state, or when they did something with the state, it was oftentimes done with gritted teeth. These people, these movements, the individuals in here may have, have, many, may have many different concepts of freedom and liberty, but, but I believe that many of them were on the right train of thought. All these correct st strands of thought, the ideas that war is bad, that the culture was wrong, that the state was a mistake of some sort, that being sexually free was important in several ways, all these things resonate with each other, and I believe supplement one another in many great ways. The problem with most libertarians is that they do not see that this is the case. They had instead like to worry about the state advocating for same-sex marriage. Let the oppressive institute of marriage reign equally, damn it. Uh, I don't like marriage, for future reference, I guess. Um, so, or seeing gays serve in the military, so the state organization that goes to other countries and kills other people for usually no good reason can be more inclusive. Yay! No. Uh, the point is that uh, tying up polyamory and left libertarianism, that in doing so, the hope is to bring back some tradition that libertarians have seemingly long forgot that exists in both left libertarianism and polyamory, and bring to the forefront of their mind the radical notion that the state is not the only problem in the world. Um, I don't think there's much of equality before the law. Um, like Rothbard said, if you're legally... But if you're legally, uh, I apologize if I'm talking too fast. If I need to slow down, somebody let me know besides my, my girlfriend. Um, but I am in a rush because uh, it's already 549 and I'm, I'm like scared to death. I won't even finish this. Uh, there's not actually too much more. I, I literally have like two pages on uh, m the WordPress document. But anyway, if you have questions, please ask them uh, or please put them on the um, discussion board uh, whenever you feel ready. So anyway... Um, I'll, I'll skip the, the legal equality thing. So, towards a more loving world. Um, 
How can this be done? What could exactly be compatible between these ide two ideas? For one, the consensual part of these relations is key. And so is the open honesty, tolerance of others, acceptance of different people, and lifestyles. And of course, the love. The love is the, the, love is the most important thing, I think. But, so I do want to stress it quite a bit. That not only are you loving, but you love freely. If you think you can, if you think you cannot love freely, that men with guns will come to your house to take you and your lover away, or your customer or your client, then how free are you? Likewise, if you live in a society in which people discriminate against you and try to uh, for expressing your sexual preferences, insofar as they do not violate moral laws, how free are you? Will you feel chained to other people's preferences in your own body? This is not healthy for a relationship to the world, and often this is what poly a polyamorous person feels, what the sex worker feels, what the prostitute feels. We need to show solidarity to these people. These people not only have difficult enough lives in their own right, even without the state, but the culture demonizes them, calls them trash. Some says they're all sex slaves. They're not. And others say they're sinners. They're not. How can we love in such a society? How can we dream of a better world without liberation? How can we love? We cannot love. That is the one thing the state won't let us do, that it has repeatedly shown that it won't let us do, that we need so badly to overcome. We cannot love. The state's taken away the dearest thing on this goddamn planet, and if that doesn't make you angry, if that doesn't make you an anarchist, if that doesn't make you want to support not only things like polyamory, at least in the passive accepting stance, then what will it take? Will it take a bigger police state for you to realize we are not free? That love is ordained by God and politicians and not the individual choices? That the church decides what is best for your body, or else men with pens and big pieces of official paper back with men with guns decide what's best for you? The practice of both the state and religion currently restricts the human spirit and the capacity of love, and these are heinous things that the libertarians should look to overcome as at as many points as they can. Now, I'm not for any sort of abolishment of religion. I, in fact, think religion can be a love-filling uh, relationship, so long as it keeps to itself to the point of not forcing itself on others, as well as other variables that I won't get into. Still, I think it's another mistake of modern-day libertarians to sometimes not demonize modern, highly bureaucratic, and hierarchical relations that claim there is someone higher than all of them and that they shall always be under. In this case, it would be, it would be God. They shall only rise if they give themselves up to this higher being and submit their will and their mind. Uh, sometimes, sometimes something seems wrong about a society or culture that would fully embrace something like this to me. But to get off this tangent, and I guess it's a tangent, I say we break free of these chains and that this is where left libertarianism comes from and comes into play with polyamory. The left libertarian cry is what the person trying to celebrate the sexual lives are seeking. What polyamory is, is what the left libertarian may want to look into if they want to discover other options besides monogamy or marriage. We must de-emphasize the political methods that, as a mostly failed method and replace them with direct action, education, agorism, and dual power, and building this new, more loving society within the shell of the old, and unfortunately a very loveless society. Will that most likely lead to polyamory, though? I don't know. I'd like to. I only pause for a second because somebody posted something in the chat. I'd like to think that if more people actually knew the options, that the playing field uh, would be more equal on both sides, and that people would at least try it or show more affection to their partners. People would not be called her boyfriend or my girlfriend or treated like property. Uh, I I have problems with the the sort of terminology of your mine, I'm yours. I still use it, but it's it's kind of iffy to me um, in some ways. But I I think it's still okay. It's just it's kind of a cultural thing, anyway. Or treated like property. They'd at best be seen as equals in a mutually loving relationship. Now, from what comes out of all this, I know not. But what I do know is that it'll be beautiful and it'll be love and liberation like nothing before. So thank you. Um, I apologize for getting a little bit darker. I'm not going to turn on my light because I haven't had the light on the whole time. But um, where's your... Uh, not where's your questions. That sounds too demanding. Um, so... So anyway, um, is the you know is the sound working for everyone? I haven't I haven't uh, I haven't checked in a in a bit. Um, so I hope I that came in. Uh, Joseph, I'm not planning on abolishing property. I just said. Uh, I'm skeptical of property. Um, so that's that, I guess. Miscommunication there. Um, okay. 
Uh, has sound been working the whole time? Uh, I really apologize if it hasn't. Uh, I never reloaded the page, so now I'm really paranoid. Um, I'd also like to thank, um, if anyone's, no, no one's going to ask me a question. My, my girlfriend is like begging me to tell everyone that she's awesome and stuff. But I'm not going to say that. Instead, I'm going to um, thank her for sticking by me in my expo exploration of ideas like polyamory and anarchism. And she's actually an anarchist, and we're uh, interested in opening up a relationship. Um, so it's like, you know, it's just such a big relief that I can find someone else who shares these ideas with me and does it in a very loving and caring way and supports me and just does all this amazing stuff for me. So for those reasons, she is awesome. And uh, she has friends that are awesome, too, I guess. So anyway, um, how do I plan on abolishing racism and sexism? Well, Joseph, how do you plan on abolishing... Uh, these straw mans are getting ridiculous, because I, um, I, I never said that I was planning on abolishing any of these things, just that I'm opposed to them. Um, so how do you plan on abolishing things like aggression? Like, I, I'm guessing you support the NAP. How are you going to get rid of oppression? Or, or aggression, rather. I don't think you are. In, in fact, I think you want to minimize it to the fullest extent that you can. Um, I look for the same thing. Um, so, there you go. I mean, again, you're just kind of straw manning me. Uh, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to clarify my position. Because I don't support abolishing racism and sexism. I just ho I hope that they'll be minimized as much as possible. I have many cultural... Um, I have many cultural beliefs that libertarians don't dare touch, like feminism and, and um, other things. Uh, although I'm not a feminist myself, I just have a lot of leanings towards it. So, um, I apologize if, if the sound wasn't in before. I, I don't know if it was, um, but it, it looks like it, it was okay. I don't know if it wasn't or not. Uh, somebody should tell me whether it was. So... Anyway, I'm not making any racist jokes or anything like that, though that, I'm sure that would be kind of funny. So I'm just checking the past comments. Um, did I say abolishing repression? I don't believe I did. Wh which is probably where you're... Right, I said... Um, they may argue that while abolishing the government is important, it doesn't mean make sense to just stop there. This was kind of poor wording on my part because I didn't mean that once we... Uh, oh, thank you, Scott. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, so I Evan is going to do the uh, the, the uh, honors of making a, um, a uh, racist joke. Thank you, Evan. Um, I'm not actually opposed to racist jokes, so I'm not calling you out on it. Um... So, Joseph, um, I, I said uh, abolishing the government. It shouldn't stop with abolishing the government. I never said that... <laughs> I never said that um, that we should abolish everything afterwards. I just said we should work towards minim... Or I meant that we should work towards mi minimizing it. So, sorry about that. That was poor wording on my part. I apologize, Joseph. I don't have much more time. Just a few more minutes. If anyone has really quick questions, um, then... Um, <laughs> Hoppa. I'm not even going to get into Hoppa. I haven't read his stuff, but from what I've heard about him, he sounds terrible. So, anyway. Um, so, yeah, I literally will stick around for about 30 seconds. Um, so, anyway. Um, if anyone has any more comments or questions about left libertarianism or polyamory, please ask me on my Facebook Um I'm not as interested in debating with other people as I used to be, but, um, you know, I'm still open to it, I guess. Um, so, that's it, really. Um, I apologize about, I don't know, anything that's gone wrong in this presentation, but I think I did a lot better this time around. Um, so... Yeah, well, I'm I'm not pr I'm not forming uninformed opinions because I've read some of the stuff that I don't like, uh, Evan, and I see it and I know what I don't like with it. So I've seen stuff from him that I don't like and I've read it. So it's not an uninformed opinion. Um, so thank you so much for everyone. I'm uh, going to be doing a base uh, a base presentation of um, um, Rage Against the Machines' first album on Sunday at 4. So please check in for that. It's a Facebook event, too. So any more questions, please ask me on my Facebook. Thank you, and uh, laissez-faire.